Welcome, Rekabor. Digital identities will define our future lives. They will determine if we will be able to freely move through the world or if we will live in one of total surveillance and control. I will talk about both the opportunities and risks of digital identity and of two possible ways to realize them. One that is straightforward but dangerous. The other is more complex, will take more time to implement, but is much safer. Digital identities already are an omnipresent part of our everyday lives. Currently, they encompass our messages, our calls, our pictures and videos, as well as our social networks. All these have already gone fully or mostly digital. In a few years, however, digital identity will also refer to pretty much everything we still physically keep safe in our wallets. Cash, credit cards, social security cards, driving licenses, and even passports. And in this world of duality, digital identity on the one hand no longer remains within the realms of the digital, but already starts entering the physical world. Now, many people are starting to feel deeply uneasy about this. And working in computer security myself, I am aware of and truly understand those fears. Honestly, I share some of them. However, I also see the potential benefits of digital identity. So let's first look at the two sides of the coin. There are many such potential advantages, both in terms of convenience and in terms of security. Works of science fiction, such as, for example, the 2002 movie Minority Report, I assume many have seen that, have visualized a world in which we can move without apparent borders, all without carrying any forms of physical identity tokens with us. Unlocking our homes or our office doors, using public transport, entering and starting our cars, visiting a hospital, checking into a hotel, making payments, or even crossing country borders simply based on who we are can become possible. When we digitize our identity information and make it available via internet services. This digitization enables seamless identification of humans across the planet and could clearly be a win in convenience and for everyday lives. <laughs> Probably the most immediate gain in convenience would be to get rid of pins and passwords. I need to come to the front here so that I can see you. Please, just a quick hands up. Who loves entering a pin code every time you want to look at your phone? <laughs> I counted two, and I'm amazed because I'm not raising my hand here. Maybe another one. Who likes remembering 100 different strong passwords, one for every web page that you tend to use? OK, there are a few weirdos in here. Sorry about that. I'm not raising my hand either here. With universal biometric authentication, we would no longer need those pins and passwords. We could use not only digital, but also physical services, simply just opening a door based on who we are or what we do. There are additional advantages in terms of security and privacy. Imagine a digital passport running on an internet service. That cannot be forgotten, lost, stolen, or destroyed. An online wallet can verify if it is the owner who is trying to make a payment and more easily detect theft or abuse. A digital driving license 
can prove its owner's age without revealing any other details of their identity. In fact, most interactions in real life do not require a person's full name, address, date of birth, or nationality. Yet, checking into a hotel with our passport or showing our driving license to a car rental agency reveal all these and many more details of our identities. Digital versions of such documents can be made to reveal only those aspects that are relevant to a current interaction, such as, for example, the vehicle classes a driver is certified for. Many ongoing projects currently demonstrate various use cases of digital identity on our smartphones. Mobile payment is already a reality in many parts of the world. Wireless door locks with associated smartphone apps are already being sold. And by 2017, my research group will demonstrate the Austrian driving license on Android smartphones with all the legal implications of a valid photo ID. Sorry. Additionally, we will add the capabilities of privacy-sensitive use of specific attributes. What all this means is that a bouncer or a vending machine should only get proof if the owner is or isn't over 16 years old, but no other details of their identity. On the other hand, the same ID should be suitable to, for example, open a bank account or to prove your real identity when renting property. This digital identity on smartphones is happening already. The next step that I want to primarily talk about today is to move such digital ID from smartphones carried in our pockets into the so-called cloud. This will enable even wider use of digital ID in the physical world. The obvious path to do so, the obvious path to implement this is a global, centralized database with our biometric information. Our faces, voices, fingerprints, and iris patterns can be used to authenticate all of our actions in the digital and physical worlds. Different so-called verifiers, such as border guards, hotels, or public transport could rely on this authentication without having to perform their own identification and verification procedures. Moreover, such a system would most probably even be completely free of charge to end users. Facebook, Google, and others would happily build and run a database with the biometric information of the whole world population. It would be for free, it would be a global service. Now, there are two main concerns with this approach. First, after about 18 years working in computer security, I have no idea how we would possibly keep such a database secure. It would be the main target as a successful attack would enable taking over any identity. Second, and more importantly, a central database of digital identities would give immense power to whoever controls it. And now imagine such agencies, or shall I say no such agencies, gaining access to not only your digital communication, but also all of your physical world interactions. Keep that mental image. It gets worse. Because whoever directly or indirectly controls such a database would not be limited to only surveillance. Censorship of a digital identity would mean a virtual death. 
cutting a person off many of the services required for daily living. Science fiction has also portrayed these implications. And many dystopian visions built exactly upon such a central identity database. So, we may want to gain the advantages offered by digital identity, but we should, in any case, avoid this centralized control with all its risks. So let's try to decentralize the whole concept. This decentralized model is maybe not as obvious, but it's much safer in many ways. To allow all of us to move throughout the world freely without carrying any forms of identity tokens, without remembering long passwords, biometric authentication indeed seems the best approach. So we will still need biometric identifiers in the environment. These, identif uh, these biometric sensors will be run either by the verifiers, can be run by ourselves, or by independent third parties. These sensors can and should be as decentralized as possible. As long as they provide live data, they can be used for digital authentication. The main difference, however, is to decentralize digital identities themselves. Instead of a global database, a centralized database, I propose to associate every individual with what we call a personal agent. This is more than an entry in a database. It is an active piece of program code acting on behalf of its owner. This is a digital shadow tracking and at the same time enabling the owner's interactions in the digital and physical worlds. It is the only instance that is involved with all these interactions, and so can act as the authority of the individual's identities. This should be the only place that stores a person's biometric templates and uses them to authenticate their actions based on live biometric sensor data. In such a system, a three-way communication will be required between a verifier, a verifier that needs to authenticate certain aspects of an individual's identity, the available biometric sensors, and the associated personal agent. After being triggered by a verifier, a biometric sensor will forward its measurements only to the respective personal agent, which in turn can use those measurements to authenticate the required attributes of a person's identity to the verifier. I have to admit, in practice, this will be a tiny bit more complicated. It will require cryptographic protocols with bidirectional network communication. It will require secure hardware, such as smart card chips, and independent validation certification of the respective implementations. Yes, this is more complex. And no, I don't have all the answers yet. There are still some sub-issues that we will need to solve in the next few years. But by decentralizing the components and their communication among each other, a verifier can only receive those aspects of a person's identity that are relevant to the current interaction at hand. It is clear that those personal agents still need to be executed and be available via internet services. However, in a decentralized model, their owners can choose where to run them on their own smartphones, in their own homes, or with the cloud service provider of their own choice. And every owner can choose when to temporarily or permanently turn off their personal agent. Disabling the advantages in terms of convenience and security, but also preventing the tracking. There are so many opportunities that we should no longer debate if we would like our identity information to become digital or not. While we have that debate, many will already be implementing it. Instead, we should influence how this is being done. We should design digital identities 
in a manner that support the advantages, but <laughs> prevent or at least minimize the risks, the associated dangers to security and privacy. We should take into account different views on privacy and freedom of speech. And this I cannot emphasize enough. We need to do this now, as long as it is not too late to change the course. Let's not accept one or only a few large organizations to take control of our identities. We should design digital identities to be as decentralized as its users and use cases will be. We should demand to remain in control of our own digital shadows. Thank you.